Well, welcome everybody. This is the Fall Line with Chaos and Company. I'm Dave Capron, and we are here tonight to speak with Peter Howard, one of our Ed staff members, long time. And as we before we get going here, I definitely want to thank our sponsors, which is Blizzard Technica. They've been on for the second year, really helping us out, making these podcasts possible and making it easier for us to make it happen. Um, so if you're out there and you're looking for skis or boots, you know, jump on there. But we also have Pete tonight, and you'll see his Rosies in his background. So they've been pretty good to him, too. And then uh, also Nick's boot fitting over at Mount Snow. Nick and George do a phenomenal job. Nick Blalock over there. So if you need any of your boots worked on or you're looking for some new boots, check them out. Nick has been super helpful with us in making the podcast roll. And then we are looking forward next summer. Uh, to get on some rollerblades and do some stuff with rollerblade, rollerblade on this year. So if you haven't been on the skate to ski and rollerblades, you should try that out. Um, all these crew, all these people are really helping us out and making the podcast possible for you guys. So if you can support them, it would be great. And I am here with Mr. Angela. Angela, I see you up there with Ski the East right above your head. And the East is getting ready for snow tonight. It's not quite up to Pete yet. It's it's coming in where I am, but I believe it's snowing where you are. We got about six inches um i'm at i'm at our condo at hidden valley resort right now which is a 15 minute drive from our house yeah. and um it was about a 40 minute drive up tonight it's pretty it's pretty wintry out there i had to shovel that's, a little snow yeah that's cool mr yeah. shostick was was sending me photos of down at the big and friendly at his place was snowing stan had snow and uh jess is coming home from florida so everybody is ramping up and uh i know pete's probably excited they have to be blasting snow up at sugarloaf i saw some picture mr butler was putting it on and uh i am just ex so excited to have you here tonight pete um i don't know if people out there know that uh you've been an ed staff member for a long time you're part of our board now we'll talk about that later the chair of the board you've been um our certification our education and certification chairman i probably can't list all the things but one that's really cool that just happened that i found out at the last second was kind of bummed it was after it happened peter howard was was put into the main ski and snowboard hall of fame up at sugarloaf huh yes that's correct <laughs> how was that uh, how was it yeah well, it was uh interesting to stand up in front of 250 people and try to make sense of it all for them. Um, yeah. There were some other great people there that actually some were my early skiing. I looked up to some of these people, Carl Anderson and Peter Smith there in the main hall of fame and Scott Hoisington, a guy that some of the membership might know. Um, he was Bodie's coach and he actually did my intro mm -hmm. for me. So, um, and that was really nice of him. He was the one who, who uh, actually nominated me. Um, so that was great. You know, I've had some close calls in my life. And fortunately, this is the only time I've been indicted. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, did you have anything in your speech? or or Because I've always been amazed at how Pete can come to an event come to a day of skiing like when we go to mount snow and we're doing our training getting ready for management center you'll come in in the morning and have the, the usually the little small sailing bag with some stuff in it but you're ready to go man it's almost like the helmet's on the goggles around boots are the only thing about you have to put on and pete is like ready in two seconds to go skiing how do you do that uh well uh <laughs> it just comes from um my, maybe my construction work i like to be efficient and uh don't like to waste time if possible and uh i i know that some people are good at winging it i'm not i, I try to be prepared may and i try to make it sound like i'm winging it but i'm really not i prepare for stuff <laughs> yeah i i remember that i mean angela there's one story that i know it'll come up it would come up later in the podcast but because he said that right now it was quite a few years ago. I think I'd been on the the board of examiners for a while, you know, probably six, seven, eight years. And Pete was the education cert chair and had been the whole time I was on. And we were at training indoors and I'm sitting next to Pete, where if I sit next to Pete, I have to be quiet. I stay out of trouble. Um, if, if I don't, Pete grabbed me and make sure I stay out of trouble. So you I, well, we're ha I can't even remember what the session was, but we're listening to somebody and things are going on for training and and pete's writing stuff down and i'm like 
I'm, I should be writing something down. Pete's writing something down. What's going on right now? That's so important. And, and I had to lean over and ask him and go, Pete, what are you writing down? And he was actually writing something down from the session we had just finished because you were going to report out and give some, and you were actually writing down what you wanted to say to make sure you had the words and it was concise to make sure it was said to the group in the shortest fashion, but to hit the point. It was very important to pick all the words. It was that that has always hit home me of being prepared to and say things that are meaningful. It was, it was kind of cool. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I tried to do that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, that that one has always stuck with me. That like you know, it's important every word and and how it's said. And you should you know when you're speaking to a group like that, you should uh, make make sure that you have the right words, which I always don't. <laughs> <laughs> I need my dictionary and thesaurus then to get it all done. But uh yeah, that's exciting, Pete. I was I was I would have loved to have come up to the um Hall of Fame thing. I saw it that afternoon, your your daughters. I think that was both your daughters in the picture with you, I think, on Facebook, wasn't it? That um had posted that and I'm like, Yeah, that is cool. Family up there with you watching it and everything. It was like that was awesome. Really cool. So um, hey, um, so I need to know the background, the background of Pete Howard. We've been skiing together for how long? Like over 20 years, I've been able to ski with you and learn from, you know, you, when did you come to the States? I mean, it took the longest time before I figured out that you, somebody said, oh, Pete's crew leaving. It was one of our trainings. You were cruising off, I think near 2007 or eight, maybe, and had to get your citizenship. And And so tell us a little bit about how Pete Howard came to the U.S., so uh, my parents were English. My mother was in the London Royal Ballet, and my father was a professor of Greek and Latin at Oxford. And after World War II, England was a little bit beat up. And so my dad got a job uh, teaching at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. And at four and a half years old, um, I came to America and uh at 13 years old, I moved to Maine, and that's when I first uh, started skiing then. Oh. Yeah. And, and what was that first experience like? Was it with friends? Was it family? Was it I was with my, I, ha I happened to move next door to a family, and they had two boys, and one of them in particular was a fantastic skier. And uh, he said, yo, you got to try this. And there was a hill between my house and his house. And so for the first year, first winter, all we did was walk up and down that hill. I mean, he went skiing on weekends, some, but mostly I didn't the first year. All I did was walk up and down that hill, try to make a parallel turn and jump. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. And, and how big was the hill? Oh, it was probably had a, 50 foot vertical maybe yeah. but it had two rolls in it, you know and the rolls were good because they yeah. they you know they rock you back and then you have to go <laughs> forward and if it rained you could go right past my backyard and into the neighbor's yard which was fun when it was icy oh my god that is so you cool go so what was the what resort what ski place you know when you finally rode a chairlift or t-bar where was that at so the first uh, lift service skiing I ever did was one day at Saddleback. And then after that, I didn't go back to Saddleback again for, gosh, must be 20 years. I, it wasn't because I didn't like it or anything. It's just where somebody happened to take me. And uh, yeah. after that, it was Sugarloaf all the time. No. Yeah. It happens to a lot of people. They go to Sugarloaf and then they never, that's it. That's the place. <laughs> well, and I. I did when I was 17, I went to school in Switzerland for a year and that was uh, quite an experience. And that, I don't know, that kind of opened my eyes to what skiing really was as a lifestyle and a sport and, uh, and the European heritage of it all. And uh, so that was, that was very interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so did you, I mean, you obviously had the bug right from when you were going down, climbing that hill, skiing down, climbing the hill and your buddy went skiing the weekends, but you were just up and down that hill that obviously if hiking that much to make a few turns on that 50 foot vert hill where there was no grooming and, and, and none of the, no corduroy it, that had to be, you, you must've been hooked right from that. Um, I, I don't know. I just was doing it because of 
my friend, really. Yeah. You know, he could do it. And so I wanted to do it. In order yeah. to, to be with him, he was basically my best friend. Yeah. I had to figure out how to do that. <laughs> uh, so did he did he give you any advice? Did he coach at all or not really? <laughs> no. So he he was like a regular regular like we do also and like just make fun of each other. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, later on and um I think that I learned the same way that people in terrain parks learn nowadays. You know, it's experiential mm -hmm. learning. You just go out with your friends and you try stuff and and you watch and you try it again if you can't do it and you try it again and and after a while you can do it. Um, yeah. I guess that's how I learned to ski. And, and because of that, um, it definitely caused some bad habits that I'm still trying to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get your gear? Like, you know, and, and. Well, at first it was, you know, somebody had some older skis and, uh, and actually, believe it or not, it was a pair of Blizzard Super Epoxies, these yellow things, you know. <laughs> um, and, and they were leather boots, but they had buckles. They didn't have laces. Yeah. And they were just something that was kicking around that I basically yeah. got given for that first year of walking up and down the hill. And then yeah. after that, my parents would give me, um, you know, something for a birthday or for a Christmas. And, and that would tide me over yeah. uh, for a year or two until I needed yeah. them again. <laughs> yeah. So how far were you from Sugarloaf when, when you were young like that in high school? Oh, about an hour and a half or so. Yeah. From yeah. Waterville, Maine. To, yeah. I lived in a little place called East Vassalboro. Can't get there uh, from here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so did you ever take a lesson before you started to teach? Um, not really. The experience in Switzerland yeah. was interesting because we had a guy that uh, his name was Giancarlo Feli, and he skied with his feet stuck right together. He had Swiss boots and had uh, Swiss Rossignol skis, Swiss gloves, and he had about eight American kids behind him. And he'd say, follow me. And then... Uh, He'd go away and we'd fall and crash and catch up and he'd count us all and go, follow me. And uh, I mean, it was great and it was awful as a model for ski team. It, it was great because he took his places and it was great because at that day and age, his image was what you were trying to do. Yeah. But he never gave you any advice at all. <laughs> <How to do it. laughs> oh man, Angelo, maybe that's why Pete is such the amazing ski teacher today because he, he remembers his buddy didn't tell him anything, wouldn't help him, just follow me and figure it out. You can't keep up. And then Philippe from Switzerland, you know, just come on, let's go. <laughs> it's a much more Darwinian approach than we it's tend to take good. now. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, that's kind of cool. So how did you become to, was it high school? Was it college after, when did you start teaching skiing? So, um, after I graduated from high school in Switzerland, um, yeah. I went to college briefly, but I didn't like it. And it started snowing and I quit <laughs> and, uh, I went up to Sugarloaf with my friends and basically became a ski bum for about the next seven years or so. And um, during that time, I got kept skiing with my next door neighbor, who by then was a fantastic skier. He got the four run downhills and things. And I also had another friend uh, named Joey Cordeaux that was four time world pro mogul champion eventually. And so there was a gang of us up there that all just banged around for about <laughs> six or seven years. And then Finally, this lady um, on the ski school, she said, Pete, you sure seem to like the ski. You ever think about joining the ski school? And about that time, you know, I'd gone up and down Sugarloaf 10,000 times and I was ready to do something a little more interesting. And so uh, there was a, a tryout for the ski school and it, it happened to have uh, Paul Brown uh, and Dave Merriam and Hayden McLaughlin in the same hiring clinic. Oh. And so we all got hired and uh, 
you know, there's this book called The Talent Code that's about the way that groups of people who who work at something and get better and sort of push themselves. Well, I, that's kind of what happened to me to be around Dave Merriam and Brownie and Hayden. Um, and so that really helped. And uh, I, I was just blessed to have uh, that lady ask me to to try out and then to have those guys as my friends to to play with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of talent in that group right there, skiing and teaching and just just work ethic, man. They all work hard at it. And general nonsense too. Yeah, well, yeah, there's <laughs> definitely that's probably a high, high. That's probably number one on the list with that crew. Oh man. I, I imagine we can put you into that list too with some of the nonsense back then. Well, somewhat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Angelo never has any nonsense. He's he's been straight and narrow all my life <laughs> oh, it's life. Yeah. oh god so how did you catch the bug for psa i mean it, it is amazing when i look at like these guys you're talking about Miriam and hayden and 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 so there's been a ton of folks since lanny's up there and steve moore and just we have more coming butler and Allie and bethany i mean i know i'm missing names because uh t-bird huh? and um you know others but What's the culture like up there? And when did you get the bug for the PSA thing? Well, so um, it was suggested to us that we should join PSIA. And a bunch of us went to our level one. And that was the next time I skied at Saddleback. And then, I don't know, maybe a year later, we went to our level two, which was actually called associate certification then. And... Um, I failed my associate cert exam um, because I didn't know what the skills concept was, or I didn't recognize that it was called that. I knew about edging, turning, and pressure management, but uh, I deserved to fail that. And uh, so I just sort of, I didn't even really know enough about it to, to kind of care at that point. Mm -hmm. and so some time went by and, and I noticed that Brownie and Dave and other people were skiing different and better in some ways than I was. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this again. And I'm not taking any prisoners this time. <laughs> <laughs> I went, went back at it, you know, and, and made it right through um, development team and ETS, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it was kind of a, it was kind of a peer thing, but, but along the way, um, you know, I met some of the guys that were, and gals that were very good at what they did. And I could see that in the way they skied and the way they taught. And so I started to think, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be one of those people. That's cool. So at what point did you know, cause I know for me, I went a long time before I knew anything about the national team, you know, and, and so this is before my time of starting in when you were coming in, when did you learn about the D team? Well, <clears throat> I knew Dave Marion, you know, he, he seemed to know just what he wanted to do right from the get go. And, yeah. and so he made it onto the team at a very young age. And, uh, um, you know, I was married at the time and uh, my kids were really little and that was where my attention was. Um, I really didn't think much about it. I also was a British citizen, and so I couldn't try out for the team anyway. So there was a while there where I didn't really pay too much attention, truthfully, to like the evolution of where things were going and so forth. I just skiing at Sugarloaf and doing Eastern events and bringing up my family. And and uh, and, and I, at some point there, I became certification chair, but that, that's a different thing. But yeah. when I was about 50 which is a little late i was like okay i'm gonna become a u.s citizen i'm gonna get my coast guard captain's license and i'm gonna try out for the national team so uh that's when i started to pay a lot more attention to th that and to the yeah. people that uh were on the team yeah yeah that's it, it's neat how our evolution goes and just what we're doing because you did a lot of travel and and still do from bar harbor because i think back then when your family was young and you were teaching up there and coming through the ranks and everything and then on the staff first you were back and forth bar harbor to sugarloaf every week 
So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't know what we do, but instead of telling them a big, long story, I just tell them in the winter I drive in the dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, he doesn't have to use many words. He, he picks, and it's short, and it's like he drives a lot in the dark, and then you just, you know, it's great. Um, but, yeah, there had to be a lot of back and forth, and, and – uh, but you do love the water. I know that you love, you just put the boat away a little while ago. And uh, so you have, you have the, the sailing on the water and, and you get to go skiing all winter on a pretty big hill. So that's pretty cool up there. Yeah. Yeah. The ocean's a, a bigger place than the hill. And the, I guess, I mean, there's hills in this world that scare me for sure, but the ocean, I'm always scared, which maybe <laughs> is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, when I go out, if the few times I've been out, on sailboats and stuff on the ocean it's like i make sure i have a good captain because when i'm on, when i was on the lake with my boat it's like it, it's kind of i can see the shore on all four sides all the time right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then no not really current in the lake so i was like okay i don't have to know that one so um as you develop pete through you know level three dev team ets um what were some of the things along the way that you learned about yourself uh, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, well, I learned that, uh, speaking to a lot of people at, <laughs> at one time makes me nervous sometimes. And even yeah. just meeting a group will make me nervous, but, but as time goes by, it gets better. So uh -huh. I've learned that about myself. Um, I learned that. Mm -hmm if if i can let people know that i want to have fun with them they'll have fun with me and uh and it takes a little while I, you know the psia learning connection model with uh the people skills and the piece about trust and two-way communication and listening to people that's that's huge you you got to do that in all walks of life and uh and um you know, being a veteran ski teacher, um, that that's probably the greatest life skill that I got from the job. Um, you know, it's it's I work construction some, and it's always interesting to listen to the communication between some construction workers and maybe the project owner or whatever. And I feel like I really have a a leg up in a way because of my practice talking to people over all these years as as a snow sports professional yeah well and i ask that because it, it relates to um you know how passionate you are as a ski teacher and i don't mean just the sport or teaching but for the people you're with you know i i know as i've come through the no matter how frustrated i would get or frustrate you <laughs> at times with with what i was trying to figure out you you always took the time and and I knew you wanted to help me and I see you with other staff members I see you with our members especially very very in tune and and you definitely wanted us to have that as examiners when we were scoring exams to have that empathy for the members that are going through this process and and it, I just I see that uh, yeah I mean well there I mean there's multiple pieces to that um, I mean, from an examining standpoint, I certainly want it to be fair and equitable and predictable and, uh, and, and as less painful as possible. But from a, a ski teaching perspective, or uh, I mean, I'm always, uh, I, I always can feel usually whether learning, um, took place or not. And, um, I don't feel good when I know that that uh, learning didn't take place in spite of my my teaching, you know. And uh, you know, you can always say to somebody after you failed, "Well, at well, um, uh, what am I trying to say?" Um, I lost it. <laughs> it happens. It happens. Oh, no, and I know what it is. Yeah. You know, awareness is the start of change. 
So that's yeah. what you say when you failed is it's uh, failed to get learning to occur, right? <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, because there's been a lot of changes. Well, I don't know, just evolution. I think it's more evolution. I don't like the, I've been trying not to use the word change, like as we go into this evolution we're in now with the assessments versus exams that we all went through, we call them assessments now and trying to, and our assessment forms and there's reasons for those, but it's kind of an evolution and and. I was with you through about 20 years, almost 20 of or probably about 16 or 17 that you were the search chair there. I was an examiner on the Alpine side and you were before that, there was evolution, but it really, when I came in was the move to the module system. I think the first year I was on an examiner in Alpine, we had the modules and that was a big change and, and you know, big evolution. And, and that kept evolving. Can you talk a little bit about, how it's evolved even from before that um that process when you were the search chair so uh, i guess um without going into a whole lot of detail about the logistics of things and so forth um you know the exam process was longer previously uh it was less defined in that you basically had three days with three different course conductors and they could take you anywhere and ask you anything at any time and uh it's gone from that to more structured more consistent and if i had to sort of put the evolution in a, in a nutshell or i'd say that that it's always been a case of balance and consistency and the the difficulty has always been to to quantify or uh, the art of teaching and um, you know in a balance in terms of balance what I mean is as the business environment has changed you know how much does it cost how much time is it going to take how much time away from work is it going to take versus okay if this is going to mean anything the standard has to be upheld so that uh, you know, what goes on in the East works out West and vice versa and, and uh, other industry partners uh, see value in our certification process. So that that balance between time and cost and commitment um, has always been there. And, and a lot of the changes that we've made over the years are, are basically to try to find the sweet spot where there is balance and there is consistency um and you know we all have to realize too that for a lot of folks that are our members it's a uh, it's not their full-time occupation um, they may have some very complicated busy jobs that are far more important in life's overall scheme of things than being level two or level three and our process has to strike a balance there as well yeah. And and you thinking of that balance, you, you do have a great passion though for us to hold the standard, to make sure the pins are shiny, that um it doesn't matter whether you have bronze, silver, or gold. And I've been at a couple of events, one specific, that when we had like the two part, which we still have, you know, skiing at one and teaching at the other here in the east, that um sometimes you give some speeches to say just because you have your pin or you have what some call half the pin you get through the skiing you want all of us to keep the shine on that pin i've heard you say <laughs> well I, I do for sure and <laughs> um you know um the sport doesn't stand still and it's pretty impressive what a lot of the customers can do at some of our eastern resorts and uh you know i I really feel that a good snow sports school should stand out among the customers. Uh, and it shouldn't be that they're in the way of the customers. And I just mean that in a, I don't know how I mean that, but, uh, you know, if you want to market your staff well, they need to stand out compared to your customers. And if you're at a big ski area like Stowe or, or, Chillington or Mount Snow or or maybe maybe Snowshoe or in Pennsylvania, you want your staff to to look look like they're professionals. 
And uh, when you put a pin on somebody, if that's not the case, um, you know, that doesn't help everybody else that's wearing that pin. Yeah. So we've had many discussions, you and I, over bourbon and beers and looking out the mountain and over breakfast and dinner and different times on the phone. When Troy's is on the phone, you guys are driving, I'm driving, we're on the phone with each other, we're driving. And, and um, I've heard you talk a lot. I mean, you must be somewhat quite excited to see the development and the evolution that we're almost moving to a, across the country, same process. Uh, things are getting every year, it's getting closer and closer to the same evaluative process. The same. I mean, our assessment criteria now and learning outcomes are so are all the same. Um, and we're working towards a goal of around five or six years for the same process. That that must excite you. It does. Um, it's something that I've been suggesting since 1989, actually, when I, <laughs> I was at a certain meeting a long time ago out west. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased that this is taking place. Um, I, I would say, though, that um, even though the process and the cards are the same, we're really not there yet because the cost of the event um, and the time that the event takes are not yet consistent across the country. So it's great that we've got a process that's becoming much, much closer. Now we have to get some of the soft policy things in line so that a member, you know, will have the same cost, the same time, the same experience across the whole country. Because it's a little hard for somebody outside of the PSIA, AASI envelope to understand how a level three exam can be done in one day in one place or part of it and two days in another place or three days in another place. Um, so, so we got a little ways to go, but we're getting a lot closer. Yeah, it is, it's coming along. I know Angela's on one of those task forces, the people skills task force, huh, bud? That's, yeah, it's a lot of work, you know, and Pete, I'm, I'm just jotting down some things as you talk. And a, a bit ago, you were talking about the um, benefits, the benefits from being involved with PSIA that you've taken into your your work in construction, like your summer work and your communication skills and, and being observant of that on the job and whatnot. And when, when you, you talk about your involvement it, it's so conscientious and it's so human the, the way you yeah. present it and what's on my mind we had a we had a meeting yesterday for you know early season uh indoor meeting to just to to get all the all the ducks in around and whatnot and i have some folks on my staff who are really enthusiastic about psia and then i've got a, a collection of naysayers you know just kind of cross their arms and and shake their heads um to hear you talk about it like 1989 was 33 years ago you've been making this effort for over 30 years to just make this process more fair you know like what a what a noble thing and my question is i guess i have two questions um how do you think that perception among folks comes to be that the, the the naysayers I'm talking about, like the people who just are not interested in what they think goes on in PSIA? You have a hand, you have folks who are so fired up about it, and then you have folks who are so fired up about not being about it. Like where where is that messaging? How's that messaging get get so different? Um, you know, I I think that. Part of it is uh, we people who don't want to do it, um, we as their friends or their managers or their acquaintances need to find out, okay, so what is it? Why? why? Because just an objection to something without the reason behind it doesn't, doesn't tell us anything. So if, if the objection has got to do with money, there's ways to surmount that. If the objection's got to do with image, you know, so, you know, I know I'm an older guy. You're not going to see me doing 1080s in, in the park someplace. And maybe it's got to do with that kind of image. Um, 
if it's an image thing, the only way that I think that can be, well, one of the ways I think it can be addressed is to go ski with somebody who's really, really good, it's like Mike Rogan or a national team member. Or, uh, and, and, you know, maybe it's just one of the ed staff on a cut up crud day. Um, but people need to, people don't realize all the time that, you know, what good skiing is capable of uh, when all the fundamental ducks are in a row. And, that, and sometimes it takes some funky conditions and uh, some weird bumps and a few patches of ice to, even though you don't go off 1080s, you can do that. Um, so uh, that's, all, I guess, all I'd have to say about that. Yeah. Do you, do, Find do out you, what it is, what, it, what their concern is. Yeah. Do you, do you have do you have some naysayers at Sugarloaf who've just never bought, bought into uh, it? Yeah, I mean, part of it too can be: is it worth their while? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there is a cost associated with it, but there's also a lot of time. And and if they were to do it, it's going to take them a number of years to get anywhere based on our system. It's going to take three or four years or so. And then the question is, was it worth the money and the time? And will they be re rewarded for that? And if, and if you know, maybe they don't see the reward at the moment and don't realize some of the doors that it opens. Um, so that could be part of it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, I think PSIA suffers from a telephone game problem. You know, like we've all skied with team members and we've skied with great and staff people from from across the country and and it's it's great every time it's just like it's always good every time but i think sometimes as that message trickles down away from that echelon and the message gets distorted i, I think what's presented to people at the resort level isn't necessarily what the organization is promoting you know and and, and i'll hear things like well uh PSIA just wants us all to look exactly the same, you know, which I've never heard from a team member, but I do here in my locker room. You know, that's a, that's a funny, that's one of the questions I ask our new staff. Uh, I say to them, Hey, sh what do you think? Should we all ski alike? And uh, it's interesting. You know, some people go, yeah. And some people go, Oh no. And it's a real interesting discussion about that and it really opens up a lot about okay uh this is my picture of good skiing and these are my motivations and and this is the gal that i think i want to ski like and it's a great question to ask um yeah a new uh, at a new staff training day yeah it's a great idea and and, and before we finish part one here I want to chat a little bit with Pete about um, Pete isn't just serving our organization through his work on the, as the edge staff chair all those years and a staff member and a member. Um, you've also been on the board of directors for a long time. You're now the chair of the board for the Eastern PSIA AASI region versus division region. Now we're into the regions, so we don't have that kind of language of division. Um, what what moved you into wanting to be on the board all those years ago? Because how, how long has it been now, Pete? Is it over just over 10 now with your chairmanship? Um, well, no, it's it's not actually. Um, I've been to probably mm. 20 years of board meetings as Ed Cert Chair, but then um I was elected to the board six, well, maybe it was a little more than that, maybe it was eight years ago. Yeah. And uh I decided to run for board chair and I was vice chair for four years. And now I've been board chair for a year and a half. So I, I'm a little foggy on exactly how it all yeah. inspired, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah. So it, we, I mean, I was on the board for you. I just came off in, uh, in this past June from my seat and um, we went through a lot of evolution there with the structure going from kind of the board overseeing most everything to now more visionary and, and, and look into the future and the operation side running operations. Um, you know, how's that going? Well, I think it's going very well, actually. I think it, uh, 
by clarifying the roles of the board and the board members and the roles of um, the CEO and the office staff and the committees that serve the organization, it's, it's really changed uh, what the board does. And uh, the relationship that I have with our CEO, Kathy Brennan, is, I think, fantastic. It's great. And, and I, I didn't have that same experience um, previously, whether that was to do with the setup or not, but it it's just seems uh, like we're really doing well. And um, the things that we talk about on the board are more things like, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about recently was unaffiliated members. So there's people that are members of our organization that don't teach skiing. And there's reasons why that we think that's a good thing and reasons why we think that that's, um, I don't know whether I'd say it was a, a bad thing, but I would say that it, it's kind of a challenging thing. So I'll just give you an example. It, it's great that somebody would want to be a member of our organization and take our level one exam. Um, if they haven't taught any skiing, but they've done a lot of reading and they ski pretty well, who are we to stop them from doing that? And I believe I'm right in saying that in Canada, um, they want you to be CSIA certified before you join a snow sports school there. Now, then the question becomes, okay, so you got through level one without ever teaching a lesson. Could you do it through level two? And so th this is just an example of some of the discussions that we're having as a board that are very different than sort of looking at whether the event calendar is putting events in the right place, which is an operations issue. Um, that, that's kind of the best way I can sort of explain the transition that's occurred. We're trying to, as a board, be more strategic and forward thinking uh, than in the past when we were looking at small details and questioning reports and things like that. Yeah. I mean, as I was on the board and going through that, it, it seems like at that time we were really looking at how the CEO could be more be more um, in tune with timing and, and not have to always come to the board, be able to make decisions that were based on how they could make things happen. Um, and it seems like that's going pretty well. I mean, there's definitely been quite a bit of uh, evolution that Kathy's brought in that's it's quite positive. Uh, last year, her listening tour and getting out there, there was a lot of good feedback from that. And I think some things went into place this year due to that. You know, earlier you brought up the uh, consolidation in a sense of the exam process and uh, the operational leaders, the CEOs of the different region, see advantages in consolidation of the way um, event calendars and, and registrations and bookkeeping and things like that are done. And, and when we look around the industries, see places like, Al well, Altera, Boyne and Vail, um, they are big companies that have consolidated a lot of resorts under their umbrella. And that there's a reason why consolidation is efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's been a great thing. And um, so we're going to take a short break here. Um, because having Pete on, I definitely wanted to talk a lot with Pete because I, I enjoy doing it. And um, so we're going to chat a little bit when we come back on part two about Pete, the ski teacher and his philosophies and Pete, the examiner, a little more in depth of, uh, of how he does those things and how he mentors folks and how he coaches. Um, as you can see, he was smiling a little bit there because, oh boy, he's going to ask me some questions that are going to make me really come out and tell me my secrets. You don't have to give him all the secrets, Pete, but you got to give some, which I know you, you love doing. But yeah, we're going to take a short break and then uh, we'll be right back. <laughs> 